Guidance is internal. Ignition sequence starts. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Permission to board. Permission to come aboard. Permission to board. Permission to bring me aboard. Permission to come aboard. Welcome to the Permission Granted Podcast. Here's D.A. All right, welcome inside the freshest edition of the Permission Granted Podcast, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, tuning us in and downloading us. Hopefully you enjoyed. Hopefully you have been enjoying it. A little reminder that we have full shows podcastable each and every night following us signing off of the air on this same feed. So if you ever miss any episode of the show and want to hear it without commercial interruption, without update interruption, it's just the best. This is the place to get it. We post it on iTunes on SoundCloud as well, and then I put it on Instagram. I should say I put it on Facebook and on uh, Twitter every every single night. So if you want to listen to it, that's the best places to get it. Just type in the DA Show CBS Sports to either iTunes or SoundCloud, and you will see the Permission Granted podcast and then the regular show podcast each and every night. So uh, coming up, we're going to have George Bodenheimer join us here on uh, the podcast, which is uh, really exciting because he basically ran ESPN uh, for years, he was elevated to president back in 1998 and ran it for uh, almost a decade and a half. Uh, then he stepped away from ESPN last year and wrote a new book. So we'll talk to him about uh, his ascent through the through the chain of command at ESPN and uh, just how powerful that company became. And, and also all about the dynamic of sports media in today's uh, sporting landscape for fans. And then I'll have Mraz join me a little bit later on because uh, an old friend dropped by the, the DA show studios this week. And it's... Uh, fair to uh to kind of go back over it so uh, that is coming up here on the permission granted podcast and right now uh, it is time to welcome on george bodenheimer george how are you i'm doing very well da thank you how are you i'm doing very well as well thanks so much for joining us and you know your story kind of famously starts in the in the mail room of espn but let's go back to how you graduated from denison you had a degree in economics so When you are deciding what should I do with this mailroom situation, were you like, boy, this is a pretty far cry from what I graduated with? Well, I I wasn't sure because, uh, you know, a lot of the companies that were recruiting at a Denison in those days, you know, the starting salary was $30,000, $32,000 to be a salesman kind of job, which is what I'd been looking for. And uh, so all of a sudden uh, he said, well, uh, you know, gee, you can have an $8,000 a year job, you know, delivering the mail and driving folks back and forth to the airport. I really wasn't certain what to do. And the night after my two-minute interview, which is the first chapter of the book, the, the whole interview lasted about two minutes. I'm not sure the human resources director actually looked up at me during my interview. It was extremely quick. Uh, I drove back the 60 miles back to my house, and I I wasn't sure what to do, and my dad and I actually suggested we go out for a beer, in good father-son activity, and uh, uh, he gave me what I think is the best advice I ever received. He uh, he said, if sports television is something you think you can be interested in, then I recommend you take the job if it's offered to you, because you'd be making a career decision, not a money decision. Get your foot in the door in something you can love and be passionate about, and, you know, things will take care of himself after that. And uh, about a week later, I was offered the job. And about two days after that, I was uh, delivering mail and driving Dickie V back and forth to the airport. Well, any time that any of our listeners remember their first job or might be going through this right now, I'm sure they remember times, including myself, where you go, boy, what am I doing? You've got a degree in economics. You're making eight grand a year and you're driving uh, talent around and you're working in a mail room. Are you going at any point in time during those early years? What am I doing here? You know, I really wasn't because I I I I loved it uh, so quickly. Uh, the ESPN company to me felt like an extended family, which is you know what I write about in the book. You know, we were having a lot of fun. Everybody, you know, not everybody, but a large portion of the people were you know twenty two to twenty five or twenty six years old. Uh, we were most, if not all, of us were sports fans. We were getting a paycheck. Uh, even though the prospects for the company were highly uncertain at the time, uh, we were having a good time, and I, I really felt right at home right away, and uh, you know, it didn't bother me at all. One of the things I talk about in the book 
is how there's opportunity in every job, DA. And, you know, in, in my case, where I was assigned to drive talent and executives to the airport, you know, on a good day, it was 40 minutes from Bristol to the Hartford Airport. And so unless someone decided they'd rather walk once I had them in my car, you know, I had them for 40 minutes. And I really got to know people, establish relationships, you know, asked them about what they do in the company, learned about this, learned about that. And I really believe there's opportunity in every job. And there was opportunity for me in, in driving people to the airport. Former president and ex- executive chairman of ESPN, George Bodenheimer, is our guest here on CBS Sports Radio. So you always had an open door policy, as you describe in the book. Um, for any employee that wanted to come at any level to kind of bounce stuff off you over if they had a if they had an idea or not, how much of the seeds of that are planted when you're driving people back and forth and you are just listening to ideas? Well, I think I think a lot, and I again I I think I couldn't have had a better kind of start at ESPN than starting in the mail room and learning the company from from there and uh, and on the way up. Uh, but I you know I believe in you know people ask me about my leadership. Uh, style and philosophy and you know it can be summed up in that i i believe in people you know i i like people and uh uh that's how i grew up and was you know my my folks uh you know were very much in the same same mold and you know from a management standpoint that really translates to empowering people and when i you know woke up 17 years later and all of a sudden i was the president of the company you know i believe you got to surround yourself with the best people you can And in my case, since I grew up at ESPN, I knew the people, and I knew we already had great and smart people around me. I considered my job as a way to, you know, build the culture. My job was to build the culture and, you know, put together a team that values, you know, the organization's results, not just one of individual accomplishment. And, you know, that's the culture that we have at ESPN. And I promoted the people that embodied those cultures, that culture. I call them culture carriers. And, uh... You know, that's the approach that, that leads to constant innovation. And, you know, that's the holy grail for businesses today, which is why I think this book is a good read for, you know, businessmen and, and women and, and people that are managing businesses as well as students. You mentioned the uncertainty of ESPN back in the early days when you were working with ESPN in the, the early 80s, et cetera. It obviously turned into a gargantuan success and the most powerful sports media enterprise we have in the United States. So... At that point in time, there has to be kind of the origins of something. Even though it's uncertain at that point in time, you were observing the whole thing. What were you observing that I'm guessing gave you some sense, hey, we'll be okay because A, B, and C are happening? Well, I mean, uh, number A, or A, B, and C are kind of all the same thing. And it was it's how I got to the title of the book, Every Town is a Sports Town. You know, a year later, I... Uh, a job came open in Texas after I had decided I wanted to be in sales, and it was for a sales job to go and represent ESPN in the southwest portion of the United States. You had five states, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi, and your job was to go get the network distributed. So I find myself down there. I'd never even been to that part of the country. It was so wonderful to see, met so many great people. And my pitch was basically, hey, we have this 24-hour sports network, you, Mr. Mom or Pop Cable Operator, have a 12-channel cable system. We'd like you to put our uh, our 24-hour sports network on your cable system. And I heard the same or the similar version of the same answer in every single town I was, whether it was Waco, Tulsa, Baton Rouge, you know, you name it. The answer was, gee, George, uh, the notion of a 24-hour sports network is a crazy, crazy idea. But if you're giving it away, which we were at the time, We'll put it on because, you know, this is a sports town. Mm. And to answer your question, what I quickly realized was that, you know, every town in this great country of ours considers themselves a sports town. It may be high school, it may be college, it may be pro, depending on where you are or some combination. But sports plays such an integral part of the fabric of this country. It's so important to this country that that's when we started to see that people liked ESPN. People liked what we were doing. They liked Sports Center. They liked Australian Rules football. They liked tape delay college football and all of our early offerings. And really, that, to answer your question, you could see it building as early as, you know, early to mid 80s. And, and I think that's when we drew some confidence that if we can change the business model, we can make it work. 
30 to 35 years later from that anecdote, I mean, clearly the dynamic of sports and our passion about it has not changed. But also, sports has changed in society. As you look at where we are 30 years later, what's the biggest difference? Or is this just one in the same of what you experienced back then to, to our relationship as a country with sports today? You know, I think I, I think if anything, I think it's grown. Uh, you know, I, I think you just look at the whole business model, including, you know, the company you work for, all of our competitors, ESPN, you know, the whole pie continues to grow. Uh, interest in sports is at an all-time high, and, uh, you know, I, I see that continuing to grow. And I think it's such a unifying uh, factor in good times and bad. Look at look at the, the role that sports play in healing during tough times. You know, think, think 9-11, think Hurricane Katrina. You know, think the Boston uh, Marathon attacks. I mean, sports sports play a big role, and they're important in 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 the country here. And uh, it's turned out, you know, on a business, uh, uh, probably the most valuable content there is out there. People want to see it live, and uh, there's a new story every day. Is that really the most powerful force in cable today, live sports programming? Because in a world where things are more and more fractured, the one thing that keeps going up and ratings keep con- pretty consistent is live programming and what networks are willing to pay for it. Well, I think so. If any time in the last 25 years you predicted that the sports rights are capping or going to start to turn back the other way, you would have been wrong. And uh, given the popularity of sports and given the competition, You know, you're hard-pressed to predict when that's going to change. George Bodenheimer joins us, former president and executive chairman of ESPN. The book is Every Town is a Sports Town, Business Leadership at ESPN from the Mailroom to the Boardroom. ESPN gets um, plenty of applause, and understandably so. Uh, The company does some wonderful, wonderful work. There's one thing that always kind of sticks out from ESPN that people always criticize, which is First Take and Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith. Do, when you hear that criticism, do you cringe at all? Do you jump to the defense of that show? How do you uh, interpret that? Well, I, you know, I'm not at ESPN any longer, as you know. But when I was there, and to some extent uh, I still do, you know, I, I defend what we're doing. I mean, I'm I'm proud of what ESPN has built and what ESPN does. And there's just a variety of opinions out there, and not everybody, you know, not everybody is everybody else's cup of tea or, or likes everything that, that that's being said, but. You know, as long as the guys are honest in their opinions and working hard to produce good television, you know, they're good in my book. So that's interesting. I mean, you oversaw so many departments and so many shows and, and, and radio and, and on on um, over the Internet. And so there was never any content, writers, talent, shows, whatever, that you didn't like or didn't agree with? Everything you were kind of all on board with? Well, I mean, you know, I, I can't really say that. I just, you know, as as... You know, as the president of the company, just like if you're the head of a household, you know, you know, you can't, you know, I can mess with my family, but you can't mess with my family, right? Mm. So, I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, as as the leader of a company with 7,000 employees, I looked at my job as, as looking out for our employees and protecting our company. So I would almost say that my personal opinion of any one program, uh, you know, wasn't really the important matter. It was, you know, I'm protecting our company and I'm defending what we're doing. Now, if I didn't like what we were doing or I saw something I didn't like, believe me, I would address it. And I think, you know, holding people accountable is one of the, the you know, strongest tenets of, of good leadership. And you've got to do that. Uh, but what you do behind closed doors and what you do publicly are really two different things. So that's interesting because, as you mentioned, I think you're right. This book is excellent for business leaders and business owners and those in the corporate sector as well. Uh, and so maybe one of the, the, the dynamics that uh, you explain here is that even internally, if you're disappointed with something or frustrated by something, whatever you say publicly can't necessarily reflect that. Well, I mean, I would say it all the time. I mean, when we, in, in, you know, business meetings, you know, I want you to air your opinion and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I certainly don't want you to agree with me if you don't. But once we decide what we're doing and we open the door and we leave here, we are one team and everybody's got to be rowing in the same direction. And if you have that, you have power. You have a culture where people are are organized around, you know, one culture, one company, one set of motives. If you have people that are split off and aren't really, you know, agreeing with what you're doing and demonstrate that, then that's a recipe for problems. So in other words, even if you were frustrated with Stephen A. or Skip, you would never tell me. 
<laughs> well, you know, uh, we're having such a nice conversation now, but, uh, you know, I love those guys. And, uh, and, uh... <laughs> hey, before I let you go, final question is going to be, you helped launch ESPN HD, ESPN 2 HD, and you know, I think that's interesting because today we just take it for granted. Everything's in high definition. There doesn't have to be this kind of stipulation between the two channels or what have you. When you saw, hey, we've got this technology, did you feel like you were kind of looking into the future that this at one point would just be understood? This is where we are as a society because that's where we are now. Yes, and uh, you know that's detailed, and, and I write about that in the book. When it was a perfect example of when a company like, in this case, ESPN follows its mission statement to serve fans. I mean, our head of resource, or excuse me, our head of engineering, basically showed me and our senior management team. I mean, look at this picture; it is far superior to standard def. Uh, I know there's no agreement on the technology, and I know no one how, knows how to, you know, what the business model is around it, but we have to move in this direction, you know, if we believe what we say about following our mission. And that's exactly what we did. And, you know, ESPN got a huge head start on the comp- on the competition in, in producing high definition sports and, and you know, several year head start because we were we, we moved quickly into it. ESPN Former executive chairman and his its longest tenured president, George Bodenheimer, has a new book, Every Town is a Sports Town, Business Leadership at ESPN from the Mailroom to the Boardroom. It is an excellent read. I highly encourage it. It is a very, very cool book. Uh, George, this was a real pleasure. Thank you so much, and I really did enjoy the book. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you, D.A. All right, thanks to George Bodenheimer for joining us here on the Permission Granted Podcast. Mraz joins me now. Mraz, what's going on? Nothing much, DA. Nothing much. Feeling very relaxed here. Why very is relaxed. that? I don't know. I don't know. I think the sun is shining now. It's really just putting me in an extraordinarily good mood. Well, it's because the weather is not too hot yet. I, I would imagine in about a month or so, you're going to be sweating your butt off. And so you'll be... <laughs> You will be antagonistic, you'll be grouchy, and what have you. You know what? I am one of these guys uh, as sloppy and as heavy as I am. Mm -hmm. When it gets very hot, 95 degrees, Mm -hmm. that kind of deal, I live for that. I love a good sweat. Um, I'm not a guy who complains because I remember that just right around the corner is another digging out of about seven feet of snow. So That's not true because when the A.C. broke earlier this week, you couldn't stop complaining. Well, but that's different, though. I expect in the heat that the air conditioning be working in my place of work. That's That's when I'm grumpy. If the AC's working at work, I'm good. When I get home, hey, you know what? My AC's working at home. I go outside. I play a little wiffle ball. I hop in the pool. I love that hot, hot weather. But so you're ju- it's just about predictability with the hot weather. Of course. If it's hot when you think it's supposed to be hot. Then I'm co- fine. Well, so you're also then uh, a, a diva. You're a prima donna if you can't be well, flexible when... I think we know. Well, flexible is not something that works with no, me. that's true. In any way, shape, or form. You're probably right. You probably have me with my pants down right now, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> I don't mean it that way, of course. Um, I'm going to ask you about Brock stopping by the studios coming up here. Um, but okay. I wanted to get to one thing before that, which is an incident that you had earlier in the week. I mean, yeah, you're so cool, calm, and collected. You okay. yelled and berated a poor woman on the street because uh-huh. she parked in your parking spot i mean this was really rude of you rude of me yeah. how about you know people need she's to learn she's a female it, she's, so, it's a woman so that means she could be you know a wench if you will and just be <laughs> no, an absolute but I jerk think you should be a little diplomatic to the fair ladies are you ca- first of all i'm the first guy if i'm sitting on a crowded subway i see a lady sitting there with a standing there with a bag i'll get up i'll let her sit that's only proper any, manners any lady yeah any lady I any lady i don't care if she's good looking Poor looking, stinks, stinks well. It doesn't matter to me. Because I've debated this. When I'm on the subway, I would certainly give up my seat for a pregnant woman. Right. I would always give up a seat for a woman with a small child. Um, I'd also give up my seat for an elderly woman. But do you give up a seat to, say, a chick that's just your age or a perfectly healthy, normal, uh, you know, yeah, I, I think no that's, kids in tow? No, I think that's only proper because you don't know what they have going inside of them. You know what, what I mean? What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe they're having a bad day, and that'll just cheer them up. You don't know what's going on inside of them like it's that time of the month? Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to specific, you know, say that. So you that. give up your seat to any chick on the subway or the Long Island Railroad yeah. just because they might be having their... Uh, Aunt Flo come that. Yeah, and that could relax them a little bit and go, you know what? There are some good people in the world, and I want to be one of those good people. So you've given up your seat every time to a chick. 
if if the and now listen, if there's multiple seats around, I'm not going to just stand up and go I'll have this one. But if there's no seats available, you will always stand to give the woman. Yeah, I think that's proper. That's proper. That's how polite I am, and that's how good of a person I am. I'll tap, tap myself in the back. Now, what happened out on that street, which I'll explain to everybody. It's proper etiquette. If you if in New York City, um, in the quote unquote alternate side park in these parking spots, they're hard to come by on the street. As you might imagine, parking down here, especially on the station, is a nightmare. It's a nightmare. So now to do this, I usually get to work an hour before I have to be here and I'll camp out. Sometimes I get a parking spot right away and I'm into work early. Sometimes I'll have to circle around. But there's a side street right next to the building where I've gotten accustomed and used to since the shift has changed, uh, to knowing that I could usually get a parking spot if I wait out for a while. Now, what happened earlier in the week was just uh, terrible. Uh, I'm sitting there, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. There's a, a truck block and empty spots. It was a disaster. I was starting to get really frustrated. I was cranky. You're I parked behind a park truck that was blocking two empty spots? Two empty spots. And the guy basically was not moving. It was, and I figured eventually they got to move. It took forever. So finally got to the point where I had to be into work. Yeah, all right, I'm looking at the clock. I'm going, I've waited here an hour. I see a guy walking down. I'll never forget this Clint Dempsey jersey walking down. What team? Uh, I don't. It was blue. I don't know. So I just. How did you know it was a Clint Dempsey jersey? Eight Dempsey. I'm not that much of a fool. <laughs> so was it a Team USA jersey? Might have been Team USA. I didn't see the front. I only saw the back. Okay. He walks down and he's at the last spot in the street where you can only make a right or a left because it's at that point it ends. So I'm like, this is great. This is an easy parallel park job because I can pull up as far as I want forward to pump back. So I throw on my blinker, which is the key. You throw on a blinker when you're going to take that spot. Sure. I'm ready to go. The guy's kind of uh, you know dilly down. He finally gets in the car. As he's pulling away, this uh, sub, sub, Subaru. You called it a Subaru. A Subaru. Or, earlier I got, this it's week a tough word for me to say. When you told me this story the first time. The Subaru? It's, who has ever <laughs> pronounced that? I don't that know. It's, it's like an old lady who pronounces oil Earl or the toilet turlet. Uh, I have a problem with Subaru. <laughs> Subaru. 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 So I have a problem Not with that. Subaru, like Sabaro. No, I don't know what's or wrong with Sapporo. Me. Right. I have a problem saying it, but I know that that was the kind of car. Oh, yeah. So she comes zipping by me to the left, uh-huh. throws on her blinker, basically almost peels out, gets right into that front spot where I'm about to pull up to back right in and just backs right in almost like the Saburu does? Yeah, almost like the perfect exchange. That guy pulled out, she backed right in. Like didn't even give me time. And I was almost frozen there going, What is she doing? So now I pull, she, she zipped around you and yeah, got like, in there? Yeah, because I, yeah, there's enough room where I'm right to the right of the car. She th- pulls up to the right, uh, to my left, and zips ahead of me, and then gets right in front of where that car is backing out and backs right in as that car pulls out. you think she knew you were waiting for that spot? How do you not? You don't see the blinker? But are you behind the parked truck? No, no, no. I pulled around the parked truck at this point because I saw the guy walking. Okay, so you have no truck in front of you. No, it's just this guy ready to pull out. I'm a car's length behind him with the blinker in, obviously ready to pull in. She had no regard. So she pulls in, and I, I quickly give her the, excuse me, excuse, you see my blinker on here? You know, I'm waiting to pull in here. She goes, oh, well, too bad I knew that guy, so I, I was waiting for his spot. Now, I never saw them talk, so who knows if he called and said, hey, I'm going to be parked here, pulling out. But they never took, you would think it would be a quick, hey, okay, here's my spot. She goes, so I, so I go, so now we're doing the buddy system. Just because you know that guy, you could pull up and take anybody's so spot. So you're barking at, these there are things being barked at one another. Right, and I'm barking back at her. How she, long had you waited for that spot? Uh, for the guy to pull out? It was yeah. about three minutes. Three minutes, but you had said you had been waiting 45 minutes before. Yeah, I staked my claim to the block. There was no other cars waiting for spots. I get the next spot on the block but, when you're staying. But you said out. it was almost an hour. Yeah, yeah, it was almost an hour. So you you sat between behind the truck for 45 minutes. Right, then I saw the guy walking up there, and I got for, out from behind and the so, truck, and I followed him down towards the end of the block. Okay, so after 45 minutes behind the truck, you zip around, and now you're waiting for about three minutes. Yes, exactly. So you're going on about 50 minutes of waiting. Right, and as you can imagine, I'm getting agitated. I'm getting angry. This is actually a Monday. It's the start of my week. I'm no, I'm in no mood. No mood. No mood. No mood. So she basically barks back at me, something to the effect of, well, what are you going to do about it? Tough. My is spot. She out of the car yet? Yeah. Yeah, she got out of the car at this point and, and goes, goes, you know, oh, well. And then did behind her, she did a behind-the-shoulder locking uh, through the electronic lock of the, the car. Beep, beep, the beep, beep. The beep, beep. The no-look beep, beep. The no-look beep, beep almost to signify my spot, not yours, fatso. Get the trucking. Wow. And then so you were yelling, and and what, how did this end up? Basically, I, I was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to go trash this woman's car, get arrested, something like that. I can't do that. So now at this point, did I can't. you want to yell at her as she walked away? Yeah, but there was just, she did not, like, I've never seen somebody care less about me. Total disregard. Total dis- could care less. And she, she was a wench. She was, she was a, <laughs> she was a good looking girl. Was but, she? Oh, uh, so she was. 
she was good looking. Like a business hottie down here? Uh, exactly. And I think she kind of, she thought her uh, poo her poo-poo didn't smell, if her you will. poo-poo did not stink stink. So I had to, at that point, I whipped around because there was no backing out. And I, I was pot committed. Uh, well, I was pot committed, but I had lost. I'd gone all in. <laughs> so I had, to, uh, I had to feed the meter for a couple hours, okay. and it ended up costing me money. Three fifty uh, an hour. Yeah, for those that don't know, outside of our building, if you, it's just a flat meter. It's not a garage. Right, flat meter on the street. Three fifty an hour. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I'm mixing up because it's a one hour limit too. So I'm putting on three different cards every hour. <laughs> it was a disaster. As far as I'm concerned, that woman owes me money, and I think the truck owes me money too. What do you mean you were putting on three different cards? Well, because it says one. I have this weird thing where it says one hour limit on the parking. Right. Yeah. So I That's always not the weird thing. That's the rule. Okay, so I feel like. They're not going to let me uh, pay with the same card in back-to-back hours because at that point I'm supposed to move because there's a one-hour limit. No. So I cycle through three different cards. Really? You think they're going to deny it? Yeah. I don't That's kind of – otherwise they're going to go, wait a minute. This guy's already been here an hour. We're going to f- give him another well, hour? What, you think there's somebody on the uh, the MasterCard at the other end of that uh, parking slot going, wait a second. Yeah. This guy just – no, that's not how that works. Well, it's a one – why have the one-hour limit then? Why not just have it a six-hour limit? Because they don't want somebody paying for five hours and just parking it there. You know, so they want you to keep coming back so that you're encouraged to move that car. Well, okay. Well, I'm encouraged to change my cards. Either way, it put a lot of stress on my day. <laughs> okay wasn't good. No. I can't believe you called that woman a wench. She was. She was hot, though. I mean, she was hot. If if I Business hot. Business hot, but I'll tell you one thing. If I was at a bar and I didn't know how she snubs people on parking, I'd approach her. <laughs> but if you had known that story. No, I'd be spreading bad words. I'd be saying the woman is rats. She's she's rats in what? I don't know. Like when restaurants have rats, it's oh, a bad thing you say. Her house has rats? Yeah, she has. Her house has rats. Oh. There's another animal that you usually you say she has that. Oh, right. Right. Crustaceans. If by land, if by sea. Yeah. Okay. So, (laughs) so Brock dropped by the other night. Yeah, nice to see the guy. That was fun to see him. Uh, Definitely fun to see him. It was even fun that he came uh, bearing a pizza. That was really nice. He brought a pizza. Where where was it from? Uh, Some place, not the actual Little Italy. It was a place called Little Italy. Mm. Um, But it was very good. It was excellent. It was a good job by him. It was a good pie. Yeah, I loved it. I had two slices naturally. You almost ate my third. Yeah. I I had one. You were going to have three. Uh, Well, you know what? I had to go... (laughs) I had to go deep there in the pie. I was hungry. Was- uh, so he came bearing gifts. Yeah. And uh, generally, I think the, the switch has done Brock well. Uh, I would think so. Mental-wise, too. He's uh, he's definitely healthier mentally. He would have been much healthier if he would have made the switch with us. When right. we switched from the overnights to this slot in January. Agree. He would have been doing... So at, let's say overnight at his worst, operating on 100%, oh. Brock was probably sometimes at a 20% clip. <sighs> Sometimes that was a lot of time. Only yeah. because Brock cannot sleep during the day, and so no. you know you you were unbelievable. You could sleep uh, eight hours, nine hours, ten hours in the middle of the day. I could not do, do that. I, I was usually a six hour a day guy, and then might might have to get a nap before the show. Brock could sleep for maybe three hours, but that was on a good day. Right, and unlike Schwartz, who sleeps for three hours, he didn't want to sleep for three <laughs> no, hours. He no. wanted to get some solid he sleep. He was desperate, but he was just tossing and turning his air conditioning couldn't in his do it. apartment The was guy bad. basically lived on three hours sleep every night, eating like one muffin a day because his body couldn't take the eating times either. He was miserable. Uh, he was absolutely miserable. So he was operating on 20 to 25%. Uh, I would say if he would have made the switch with us, he probably wouldn't operating on about 75 to 80%. Right, which I guess is kind of odd. We'll never truly know we how good know. Kenny's radio <laughs> career could have been. No, we won't know. Um, I think that he's probably close to 100% at TV because it, it seems like he likes the TV side better than the uh, the radio well, side. Well, they're giving them free food, free car rides. He's got all, he's got a lot of benefits it's over there. It's real posh at the TV side oh, of CBS. It's, it's unbelievable. So he works in the CBS Sports Network, which is the television, uh, the cable outlet arm that we have at CBS that um, that broadcasts the Gottlieb show, simulcasts uh, Boomer and Carton, um, you know, inside college football, inside college basketball. So he does all types of TV behind the scenes stuff right. for him. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's real posh. They feed them well. They get them drivers. Um, yeah, it's it's when they're after hours or whatever. It it's a good it's a good deal. I think he would have been happy here. He's way happier there. 
Uh, he's definitely happier there. He's happier there. But it, I think he was kind of intrigued. I think the big reason he wanted to wait to see our show get off there. It's been five months, six months without him. I think he was very intrigued to see how how we were over here. It's almost like you know after you after you get divorced, but you know it was a mutual split up. You want to you want to see <laughs> you want to see how the other side's doing. Did they meet a new boyfriend? Anything like that? But he was he seemed very happy. You know, coming in and seeing us all. You could tell he missed us. And um, so it was a great move for Brock. I mean, it was always a no brainer for Brock to take that job. Of course, because. Uh, uh, you know, he's working on really creative uh, projects, the TV side. And, and he loves the college hoops and the college football, and he really has his hand in those shows, which is great. Yeah, it's all about college football, college basketball. He loves it. So it, it really was a great fit for him, and uh, and they value him over there, and it's awesome. So that was always cool. But it was it was obviously a big loss for us. Um, but I think what helped was he's also friends with all the guys that we work with now. Right. So he, him and James Ward are tight. Right. Uh, him, him and James Ward worked with each other in Philly years back, so they've known each other for a long time. Right. He's tight with uh, Bully Berman as well, right. who's now become Bitter Berman. So <laughs> so he, he could hang out with everybody. It was like, just like hanging out with the whole crew. Exactly. Instead of seeing some outsider unknown that kind of came in to take his slot. Right, exactly. Kind of like the wench that took your park. A hundred percent. Yeah, that even when he was sitting with us, uh, you know, where me and James sit and, you know, looking where James almost like, you know, you need to put a rose on the chair that used to be Kenny's chair on the show. <laughs> but he was totally cool, laid back watching, you know, James do everything he used to do. It wasn't awkward at all, which was really cool. What I like, though, is that uh, for as positive or as well-rested as Brock now is, he still is planting seeds of dissent within the company uh, for Rock people and he smear campaigns. People he doesn't like. Now, he did that around here for some uh, off-air people. Um, but, he, you know, so he would create smear campaigns not only for people that he didn't like, but also for athletes or teams. Oh, he, loves, he loves pushing popular opinion against what he doesn't like. And exactly. So we, apparently he, he didn't tell us who they were. Or maybe he did, and we just didn't know who they were because they're in the other building. No, he refused to name names. But uh, he's he's creating smear campaigns over there too, so he's not a hundred percent happy. No, he's not. But I don't <laughs> unless he needs to, that to be happy. Right. I don't know that a Kenny Brock is ever a hundred percent happy. <laughs> That's true. Um, That's but true. it's unbelievable. You know, he is who he is. He's going to smear people's names, and it doesn't matter where he is. But I'm happy that he's comfortable enough there that he could go to other people and smear. You know, what Kenny is Kenny's like that cancer on the show Survivor to tie this all into CBS Company ties. He's a guy you want to vote out within the first four votes because once he starts building an alliance. Bad. You're doomed. <laughs> yeah, you're He'll get you guys all out and then screw everybody on his team over, and then he ends up with a million bucks at the end. Yeah, so so he's less like T.O. because I don't know if T.O. ever built alliances. He was always right. there just kind of strictly on how great his talent was. No, Kenny's not an eye guy. He needs a team around him. He's a locker room politician. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's a guy you go to if you got some dirt and you want to hear the dirt from. <laughs> he's, a, he's a lightning rod. <laughs> Maybe he's like a stray hand. He is a little bit. He is a little bit. And then, you know, can fall in love with the coach at the end. Happy story, and away we go. Because <laughs> yeah, there's one little soft spot in Brock. Exactly, right? exactly. One, one little soft spot. You could find it, but good for him. Yeah, it was good. Uh, do we have any idea how um, how Schwartzo is doing now that the Islanders not only eliminated, but also Nassau Coliseum is officially, like, crumbling, and they're just destroying it? Uh, no. Uh, on Twitter, I had some fun with Schwartz. I called him a bit of a fraud, and he's kind of iced me out since. So I'm trying to get some, you know, I'm trying to, you know, see how he's doing. But I haven't really heard from him, so hopefully we'll feel that one out. You, yeah, you called him a fraud Islanders fan because he went to a Mets game on the day of an Islanders playoff, playoff game. game. Yeah, because you got to be watching your team in the playoffs. I think playoffs trump anything else. And, uh, yeah, he ventured off the city field as a Yankee fan. And uh, I was having some fun at his expense, but uh, I haven't heard from him since. So I don't know. I'm going to, I'll try to talk to him this week. He's not talking to you. He's not talking to me. He's I don't think he's happy with me. But you know what? Time heals all wounds, right? I wonder if he's running a smear campaign on you. He could be behind my back. You think he's doing a morass well, smear? So, so he's working with the overnight crew. I don't know. Has Tom D or has Ike or anybody? I haven't heard from anybody on that overnight show. So maybe he's running it. Oh, man. You think everybody hates Mraz now in the overnight? <laughs> I hope he's not doing that to the overnight listeners that liked me. He used to be the dictator of the overnights. Maybe and- he's turned everybody against me, and I don't know it yet. It's possible. Oh, man, now I'm going to think about this all night. It's possible, yeah. It's distinctly possible. I don't know. Something to watch out for. Okay, this is the Permission Granted Podcast. Who do you got coming up here, Ward? Uh, it'll be James Ward. All right, Ward is coming up here next. Uh, a little reminder that uh, this is the same feed that has all of our normal show podcasts as well. So if you want to listen to any of the shows, it's right here on iTunes and on SoundCloud. We tweet them out and put them on Facebook every single night after the show, after we sign off. This is the Permission Granted podcast, which is all off-the-air stuff. So enjoy that. All right. Talk to you later, and here is Mraz and Ward. 
All right, welcome into side B of the Permission Granted podcast. Man, these things just keep rolling along weekly. Uh, fortunately for my sanity, I'm not joined today. Uh, as you know, I am the executive producer of the DA Show, Sean Mraz. If you're listening to this as you do every week, I hope you do. You know who I am. But um, my sanity is saved because I'm not joined by Planet Stevo this week. Uh, it's great to have James Ward join us on this week's podcast. James, what's going on? Not much, Sean. And I, I'm glad you welcomed me in that way because I'm really not sure how you fill 15 minutes with Steve-O. <laughs> it's, Steve-O's tough. Like last week, if uh, if anybody had listened to the Permission Granted podcast, Steve-O will drift like he does on the show. He's playing with figurines in the other studio that we recorded it in. Yeah, you ask him a question, he's fiddling with his phone, doesn't respond, he, wants you to edit out the silence so it sounds seamless. Having Steve-O to a podcast is like having a pet rock. It sits there, you talk to it, you just you get nothing back sometimes, and you really have to, to shake it. And then even when you're getting stuff back, you're imagining, am I making this up? Am I really getting anything back? Yeah, I mean, you, I suppose you could throw the pet rock through the window, and that would be a function of it, but you're not really, <laughs> you're not really getting anything out of the rock. You're not getting anything out of the rock. And we're going to get to Planet Steve-O the rock because he has a big week coming up in a little bit. But uh, I just want to start. First of all, I'm aggravated today, James. I roll in here a couple minutes ago. And I just got nabbed for a cell phone ticket. A cell phone ticket. I, I can't believe we're still giving these out. But it is the law. I broke the law there. And I'm gonna have to pay, I have to pay about 140 bucks. Can you believe this? That's a lot of money for a ticket. Especially it, you're, you're doing something you know you're not allowed to do, but you think you can answer the phone quickly. Right. Tell the person. Of course. I'll call you right back. I'm driving. Oh, it's brutal. So anyway, I got to deal with that. And then I come in. I had been feeling good all day. Uh, finally got back in a good gym routine the last couple of days. I'd been very sluggish. And then, of course, uh, in uh, intern X, as we'll call him, uh, very uh, funny intern, a guy I've had some fun with, does this thing where he brings in either Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts at least once a week. Uh, it's not like you send the intern to say, hey, we need coffee and donuts. He br- goes and buys these donuts on his own, brings them in. Which is a nice gesture, but I mean, he's making everybody here doughy around around the studios. Yeah, each a guy time. like you, you you can't say no to the donut, but of you're course. not really looking to eat a couple donuts before the no, show. No, of course. So now I've been feeling good, uh, and I didn't realize he was in today. He's rarely in on on uh, you know later in the week. He's usually an earlier in the week guy. And I see the donut sitting there. So now I'm angry. And when Shawnee gets angry, Shawnee likes to angry eat. And those donuts were sitting there, and I just locked back a glaze, no problem. And I know after this podcast, I'm probably going to lock back another. You ate that glazed donut in four bites. Yeah, it's just an and ang- it, it might have been three and a half. It's a disaster. I didn't need to do that. And uh, I got to ask you, James, do you have a pro? Now, here's the thing. Here's the fine line. Do you like that uh, an intern will go out of his way to do that? Because you know what? Any free food around here is good food. But or is it almost just like enough's enough? I don't need the donut. I like it. But you're also but not again, a fat ass like I am. I, I have, no, I have no part in making the decision of whether he, he comes aboard CBS Sports Radio at the end of it. So good point. me liking the donut, me eating a donut, what's that really do? That's a good point. I guess he's trying to do the right thing, and I, I'm assuming by doing that, maybe he thinks ultimately you know, people you know, put in a good word for me when it comes time to do a job. But like, he which, did bring Krispy Kremes today. Krispy there's, Kremes. there's not a donut better than a glazed Krispy Kreme. Right, and cre- where I come from in Long Island, there's not a Krispy Kreme around, so they're hard to come by. So that's another thing, too. I'm looking, and I go, when's the next time I'm going to have a Krispy Kreme? Probably the next time he's in, but yeah. yeah, you're right. Probably 15 minutes from now when you have another one. Exactly. <laughs> there's no doubt after this I'm going and crushing another one. And the Krispy Kreme is the one donut where... I don't got to get crazy and get like a chocolate one, a blueberry one. Just give me the plain old glazed yeah, Krispy Kreme. It's unbelievable. The plain glazed Krispy Kreme, fresh out of the oven, is the oh, best donut you my can find. Goodness, James. When you have you ever been to a, inside a, like a real Krispy Kreme? Yes. Factor when they get the hot one. Off Mohegan the Sun Casino in Connecticut. Yeah. They have the Krispy Kreme right. there. Open twenty four hours. That's so right. You play the tables. You play the slots. You go get oh. some coffee. You, you get blackjack winnings uh, right Black to Jack the hot winnings right to the hot donuts right out of the oven. And there's actually a, a. It used to be there in Milford, Connecticut. I think it closed, but it was an actually a standalone Krispy, Krispy Kreme. Kreme. We used to have one of those in Long Island. It was an only one in Levittown. And if you would drive drive down the Milford Post Road when they're cooking the donuts, the whole your car smells like hot Krispy Kreme. It's unbelievable. Just it think- should be illegal because it's impossible to not stop. I think it just moved, James. I think it just moved. I'm getting all hot and bothered here. <laughs> all right. Well, speaking of things that get me hot and bothered. A-Rod in home run number 661. I don't know if that's exactly the segue I wanted to go with. You're a Yankee fan like I am, and I felt like this podcast was a good time to talk a little A-Rod because we've done so much to Flategate on the show this week, and rightfully so. 
uh, along with the the Shady McCoy comments, the Lyle Collins. The NFL clock just keeps ticking, and then you have the NBA and NHL playoffs, of course. So baseball in May kind of gets lost in the shuffle, and that's fine. But we're both baseball fans. We're both Yankee fans. And seeing what A-Rod is doing right now is almost surreal. And I, I know I'm, I thought at least I was in the minority in, in cheering for the guy now that he's back and now that he served his time. But the Yankee fans on Thursday night give A-Rod a curtain call for hitting home run 661. And it just made me smile, made me feel like I'm not in the minority here. I have a really hard time with the A-Rod situation. Well, because spill it out here. What do you got? I went into the season, and for the last two years, I wanted A-Rod to do nothing but disappear. And right. I went into this season hoping he'd hit, you know, 150 in April. They'd bury him on the bench, and they'd somehow find a way to buy out his contract. Because I literally can't stand A Rod. Boy, that's harsh. I went to spring training in 2004 when A Rod became a member of the New York Yankees because A Rod became a member of the New York Yankees. My dad and I decided, you know, we've always been talking about spring training. We got to go. It's A Rod's first year. We'll remember this forever. I. Stood by A-Rod through all of the playoff struggles. And finally, in 2009, I felt like I was vindicated in defending A-Rod. Won the World Series there. It was huge. T- completely. And you he, know, he had six home runs in the postseason. He didn't win the MVP. Matsui did. A-Rod put that team on his back that October. Ex- and again, so 2009 completely vindicated me as an A-Rod supporter. And then his actions in the last two years, just despicable, <laughs> lying, unlikable, no good. He has been. Stupid idiot. I really can't stand him. Well, James, listen. But then I find myself, like, he's helping the Yankees. The Yankees are in first place largely because A-Rod's hit That's a lot of home the runs. chicken and the egg. Yep. And just, you, we were in the studio last night together. A-Rod's first at bat. Delman Young robs him of a home run. I'm standing there about to put my hands in the air and cheer for the guy. And I catch myself doing it. I'm like... I, I can't cheer for A-Rod. I can't to. do it. You have to. Now, here's what I will say, and I will hammer this point home. Is A-Rod essentially a crook, a liar, a cheat? You can name any of those words you want to name, and you'd be accurate. Uh, do I think he's a bad guy? I don't think he's a bad guy. I just think he's a bit of a dope that just does whatever he could to make his money. And, you know, he, psychologically, I think he cares what people think about him, but he can't help but just keep screwing up. So, I don't know. Part he's of not me, a bad guy. He's just a Dope. He's a dope. He's got. But, he has no brain cells. He's totally selfish human being. He has no interest in anyone but himself. True. But now true, you look true. at A Rod. Now he's a little bit humbled, right? And which is why why I think people are forgiving him. But for me, it's just like I I can't deal with A Rod anymore. I think a lot of it is to you look at A Rod now, and he's almost. An, it's a weird thing that Major League Baseball has almost made him look like a victim in a lot of ways because of the witch hunt. You know. He's out a whole year, and then there's a guy like Ryan Braun who lied equally, and he's sitting there, and he got a brief suspension, and he hides away in Milwaukee. I mean, and, Ryan, and all that Ryan stuff. Braun ruined the testers' life. Exactly, the guy got fired. Exactly, what makes him claimed worse. he was anti-Semitic. And the thing, the thing that gets me is, okay, A Rod's been nabbed. He, you know, because he's such a big superstar, I feel like there was a witch hunt to pro- you know keep proving it, and it was just his own fault. Granted, but how many of these guys? I mean, I'm sorry. I know the Boston fans have been faithful DA show listeners. David Ortiz, to me, is no different than A-Rod. And if you think David Ortiz never, you know, took anything to get by, the guy was basically on the cusp of being released by, you know, Minnesota and banished from baseball. And then he teams up with Manny Ramirez, and you're telling me the two of them together weren't doing anything? And he's saluted like a hero. He's a, he's a World Series hero two years ago what, because we haven't heard of him. Nec- basically, him denying stuff has been lying. We just can't prove that he's lying. What makes him any different than A-Rod? And that kind of, that's what makes me side with A-Rod. I'm like, if every other fan base is going to root for their guy who if they're blinded by and don't realize he's cheating, at least I acknowledge that A-Rod's a cheater. I'm going to support him if he's helping my team. Yeah, the Boston fan has a hard time dealing with Ortiz. Oh. Because you know he was juicing. Of course. He supposedly tested positive on that, the uh, the, original, the, the secret 2004 yeah. test. Yeah. And he was, uh, you know, he was, his name has been is appeared and been linked to a lot of these lists and stuff like that. I it just it sickens me. It sickens me that guys like David Ortiz get a pass, uh, you know. And and when it comes time for the Hall of Fame, maybe he won't make it because you want you see a guy like Mike Piazza not getting in. But you know, all this hate that A Rod gets, he's no different than any of those other ones. He's just more in the forefront because he's in New York and you know, he's chasing down Barry Bonds' home run record and all. This. So so he just gets destroyed by it. But. The Yankee fans rooting for him makes it feel like he, he set, spent a whole year away. 
he served his time, just like if you were to go to prison. It's not the same as going to prison, of course, but, you know, when Michael Vick went to prison, Plaxico went to prison, they got accepted back into the league, accepted by their brothers and everything like that, and they went on to play and they succeeded, and that's what A-Rod's doing. So I have no problem with the Yankee fans giving him a curtain call into it. Is it kind of a sham that he's breaking Willie Mays' record? But again, I'll say... Who's to say Willie Mays or any of these old-timers didn't cheat in their own ways? Like, there's some kind of performance enhancers had to have been going on back in the day. It just wasn't prevalent and stuff like that. So, I can't even say for sure that, you know, Babe Ruth wasn't a cheater. So, who who am I to just sit there and judge A-Rod and act like all these people I never paid attention to and social media wasn't around and all this technology wasn't around weren't doing the worse things than these guys were? And the other thing about A-Rod... I went to a Yankee game last week. A-Rod had the day off, and I was actually bummed out about it. He's become a, a watchable. I mean, his at bats are must watch. They are must watch. Especially, it's very compelling. And the Yankees are a lot better than we both expected. We of went course. into the year hoping, hoping for eighty wins. I thought they would finish in fourth place, only ahead of the Rays in the AL East. And here they are, and they've played well. Um, and a lot of that has to do with A Rod and Teixeira combined. They have seventeen homers at the time in the taping of this pocket, which is unbelievable. If you're getting that kind of production and not getting guys like Ellsbury and Gardner, that's what the Yankees hope for. And you know, hopefully, these guys stay healthy. Really is A A-Rod, Rod's been unbelievable. And speaking of A Rod and the Yankees, a former uh, producer of Yankees Radio, Steve Moralia, Planet Steve, who we discussed earlier, and we discuss, we talk with him every other week. Who's a total knucklehead on our show, James? I have to broach this with you. I, I think you're aware of what's going on here. Uh, not next week, the following week, I will be headed down to uh, sunny St. Thomas, and then wrapping it into Florida. For a little vacation. I'll be away for uh, a whole week on the DA show. You two are going away for a wedding. We'll be awake. So the mothership's bench is getting tested to the point where you're going to get a lot of Billy Jock alone on the, on the wheels of steel. And Planet Stevo for five straight days, an entire week, will be producing the DA show. And DA is really digging his heels in here. He's a little nervous, I think. What, do you, what are your expectations for Stevo in this role? I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward I'm to it. I'm very much looking forward to it. What are you looking forward to? Is you because he's bound to make a mistake, right? Yeah, I. We should have a little fun and set a, set a number at how many mis- mistakes per day. Now, what do you consider a mistake? Because Planet Stevo just messing up an open or messing up a cold open, that's bound to happen. Like, what's a major mistake Steve can make on this show? Uh, I, the problem is that inside the show, there's a lot more pressure on the on the board op as far as noticeable mistakes. True. And Billy Jockalone's comfortable there, so maybe Steve-O lucks out because Jockalone actually has worked on the show longer than he has in a way. Out of five epic fails that Steve-O will be responsible oh, for, how many of them will be funny? Okay, so I, I produce the epic fail. That's the executive producer's job to produce the And it's fail. hard. It's hard to just fly in and do an epic fail. Right. And what basically, if you guys you guys listen to the show, you know what an epic fail is. It's you know almost like our moment of the day, our funniest moment. And generally... It's a little two-minute produced bed that I put together, um, but it, it generally could be from something that was seven minutes in length, and you have to cut down the meat and potatoes of it with little funny drops put in. So I've gotten very accustomed to it because I've done it for two and a half years. Steve-O has it. So that's a good point. So how many epic fails will Steve-O make funny? How many epic fails will he... I'm telling you right now, could Steve-O forget to put on the epic fail you lose or like end thing to it? I could see that. Where I could totally ends. see that. That's a mis- potential mistake. Um, boy. Boy, he can mess that up. The cold open stuff. Cold open. How about guess? Especially days where the cold open kind of comes down to the wire. We're not sure what we're going to lead with. Right. I, I tend to think, too, with guests, we do a fairly good job of giving our listeners some solid guests. Now, have I gotten you Tiger Woods and Barry Bonds? No. But for the most part, we get solid guests. The Steve-O guest bar, boy, what? I think DA is going to have a lot of his friends on the week that you're off. <laughs> it's DA and friends that DA week, you think? DA and friends. steve going to be struggling, you think? I mean, I'm open to give Steve-O whatever contacts I can to make sure the show flows seamlessly, but it's almost gotten to the point where I'm going to give Steve-O all the tools to succeed, but you just know, like, he can't, there's no way he's going Don Larson style and throwing a perfect game that week. There's no, no. chance. Not only that, I mean, steve going to get roughed up here. I'm thinking Steve-O, obviously he's got to pitch five innings because there's five shows. What does he give up? 15 hits, nine earned runs. Strikes out two. You get nine earned runs. He's not lasted five innings. Well, he's got to. Billy Jack moving up to the big no, chair. No, he's got to last the five innings. I think it's one of those things where D.A. just leaves him out there and takes the beating, right? No no quality start for Steve-O? I don't think Steve-O's getting a quality start. Now, here's the thing. What if Steve-O surprises us and gives a solid start? There was our perception of him change. Well, I, I work with him every weekend. I don't think I'm going to be surprised. You don't think you... you 
I don't think he could surprise me. So you're saying I you, think I know what's going to happen. So no doubt he's messing up something. Yes. Is there any doubt that you would be better in this? If you weren't going away, would you be a better producer that week than Steve-O in your mind? No comment. No comment. Would Steve-O say no comment to that, or would he say he would be the better producer? Uh, I don't think he would say either of those answers. I think he'd concede it to me. Boy, this is going to be one heck of a week. So make sure, if you guys listen to the DA show, next week will be your last sane week. That's the one where I will still be producing the week after Planet Stevo gets the keys to producing the mothership, and it'll be must listen radio for a week. And that is the note we are going to end the Permission Granted podcast on. Thank you guys for listening. Remember to check us out on SoundCloud, uh, search, uh, iTunes, search the DA Show, CBS Sports. It'll come up. YouTube.com slash the DA Show. Check us out on Facebook.com slash the DA Show. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Mraz CBS. James is on Twitter. James Ward CBS. Please get, help me get my follower count up, please. He's got to look respectable here. And remember, uh, Planet Stevo, the man who will be producing in two weeks, doesn't even have a Twitter. So that's a good start for a producer. Uh, that's going to wrap always, it up. Always a great start. <laughs> always a good start. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. As always, take care. Have a great weekend.